Thank you for coming. It's such a yucky day outside. I really appreciate it. I'm very honored to be asked to do this. Um, textiles have been a lifelong interest of mine, even as a young child, and I, I really can't tell you why I, I have such a, a interest in them, um, but I was really excited that I could get up here and talk my love, and hopefully when you leave here, you'll catch some of that, that interest. Now, I've given each of you all a piece of fabric when you came in. I know that's weird. That's okay. Wave them around. I want to see everybody wave them around. You got them. Okay. There's a reason for that. I've been a teacher, taught at Auburn University, and I learned a long time ago the eye, the ear, and something to touch makes a huge difference in what you retain. And also, I want you to, to understand that, um, that everyday things or objects are often underrepresented and they give us a vast amount of knowledge. You're not just holding a piece of fabric or textile in your hand. You're actually holding centuries worth of history in your hand. Now, all of us know that we don't wear those beautiful clothes now with all those fine details. We wear just basically squares and circles of knit fabric you know, mass production, but we still, we still are the inheritors of a long history of the development through the industrial age and pre-industrial, and, and that's what that is. And so I want you to, to be able to go out of here, and if you don't get anything else, pick up that your clothing is far more than just clothing. It's history that you're carrying around every day. And so uh, it's not only the events that shape our memories and our history, but it's those everyday things that are essential to understanding our society and our culture. And that's basically how I operate when it comes to, I'm in the curatorial department where we handle objects, and every object, even if it looks mundane and, you know, pretty boring, frankly, there's a story behind it, and there's always something you can learn just from something just really little. Okay, now, I want you to go out of here looking at fabric and looking at clothes. I've picked up a few things uh, that tell us some, just give us some clues about, whoops, okay. Backwards, am I going forwards or backwards? There we go, okay. This is what I wanted. We've got some textiles here, cotton, We've got samples over here. But look what we've got here. This is something we see every day, okay? But we don't see this every day. Now some of us, maybe not me, but some of us in our audience, this, you've worn this, okay? Here's some more, an Indian woman. Actually, that's my family. And that's my husband eating pimento cheese. But look, he's got that funny cap on, and he's got a sweatshirt with, you know, an auburn patch on it. All of those are significant. They're textiles, and they all speak to some significant thing, even though it may seem to be small. Okay. So when you go out of here, I want you to be looking at people's clothing in a different way, okay? Okay, let me make sure I got this right. Okay, now let's, let's set up 
some background, okay? This is uh, circa 1763, and you can see, I'm going to get this right. There we go. There's Fort Toulouse right there. Ogfusky, which was British. Okay, Fort Toulouse is French. Ogfusky was British. They're, what, maybe 20, 25 miles apart. But look, there's a lot of, of uh, Native American around here. And there were already trading paths coming through here, coming from Augusta, coming from Charleston, although it's not marked on there. Okay, they were going in what they call the back country. Anytime you hear that word, that meant that from Augusta or Charleston or Savannah, they were going over those small hills that are in North Georgia, and they were going back into the area beyond the mountains, the back country. Okay, a lot of traders. Uh, what, because this area was still contested between French and British. The Spanish were down in this area, down in here. And so everybody was vying to get Native American attention. You can call it a bribe if you want to, but they didn't call it that, obviously. But they're trying to, to get a relationship going. They're trying to establish themselves because this is rich with Indian pelts, deer skin, all of that. And Europe is clamoring to have that, okay? Now, Fort Toulouse was set up in 1717. Remember, right here, right here. It was never really a military fort. It was set up for trading. So the French could establish a better foothold in this area. And thanks to Greg Wasselkoff, which I was somewhat familiar with this work, but now I've devoured it. We have, can, in my field at least, give him a round of applause because he really started... Uh, laying out what kind of fabrics and tools and implements and, you know, munitions and all that sort of stuff that were at Fort Toulouse. Now, broadcloth, calico is, calico, we're all familiar with that. Cotton, which was coming from Europe, from the Far East, India, Duffel is sort of like a woolly, soft, blanket-type fabric. We have a piece in voices, sort of down low, so and it's white in pink or mauve. Take a look over there. Linen, Osnaberg is sort of like something similar to what we think of as muslin. It's heavier than muslin, but not canvas. So, Osnaberg, planes were solids, just basic, you know, fabric, no prints. Ribbons, serge, a very utilitarian, heavy twill type fabric. And if you walk out into the second floor and you can see the Indian chiefs, the Native American chiefs there, you will see a wonderful example of what they did with these uh, fabrics. Now, the, they would trade, they would bargain for so many yards of, say, calico or flannel or something like that, and the, the British or the French would say, well, that will be three deer skin. That term, it's a buck. It only costs a buck. Well, that's where that term comes from. Just one buck, just one deer skin. <laughs> Fabric was generally around two, two bucks, two pieces of deer skin. Okay. Okay. There were other people 
who were operating in this area. One was the Panton and Leslie Trading Company. They were established basically 1783, operated till around 1821. The interesting thing about them is their base started out in Pensacola under the Spanish government, and, uh, and they were allowed under the, they were Scottish, but they were allowed under the Spanish government to travel up from Pensacola into that same area I showed you and do some trading. Although the Spanish was, were uh, farther south, they still, like any European country, wanted to have some sort of foothold in there so they could make money. So eventually the uh, Patton and Leslie Trading Company, they moved all around what we consider Alabama now, some into the Tennessee Valley area, and had uh, warehouses and offices in Mobile in the 18, uh, about time that Alabama became a state in 1819. But by 1821, 1822, they had pretty much run their course. The original owners, of course, had died off. And so um, they just sort of quietly went off, you know, went off the scene. Uh, we had British traders that wandered all over the place from the east coast of Augusta, Savannah, Charleston, coming down from North Carolina, coming down from Virginia, and they would get supplies in uh, Augusta or bring them from North Carolina or whatever, and they would hit these Indian trails and just operate on their own and that's how they made their living. We do, we have some names, Adair and Tate, but those are the two most well-known, but we don't have near any, we don't have any records of near the numbers that there probably were. Now, one of the significant things for Alabama was at the end of the 18th century, 1796, um, George Washington, the government set up something called a factorage system, factors. There were government factors that would come, and they were set up all over the United States and all over anywhere there was a U.S. claim. They would set up these small stores and they would trade with the Native Americans. They were supposed to be only for Native Americans, but they weren't. Any settlers who had come into the area, whether legally or not, the factors would trade with them and allow them to buy things. And uh, the one in St. Stephens, Alabama, lasted from 1804 to basically 1819 when Alabama became a state, um, Strother Gang, Gang Strother, I always get his name backwards, um, and a partner, Alan Glover, took over the Choctaw Trading House at St. Stephen's and when Alabama became a state, and uh, they eventually bought it in 1822. But they had been serving Native American and the settlers that had rushed in after the Creek Wars were over, settlers just came in. You used to have to have a passport to come into this area. Because Sweet Home Alabama still says that when they were lying in there where she said, you need a passport to come down here. Well, they did have to have passports. That was some an effort to control the number of settlers that were coming in. But they traded with them. They let them buy things there. And then when Alabama became a state, when an area became a state, then the factorage house was no longer needed. So that would shut down. But Gaines and his partner, Alan Glover, bought this house, this trading house. And when they did, they started buying things from New York. Okay. So we've already got stuff coming in here from New York. 
right when we become a state. Now, granted, thinly populated, but we had plenty of people coming down from the eastern seaboard who had no intention of staying in their temporary cabins or their temporary quarters until they got homes built, and they had no intention of, you know, going backwards as far as material goods um, were, you know, that situation. And so we already had things coming from New York. Now, this is an example of the um, Huntsville Republican in, on September 16th, 1817, and you can see some of the things that was coming in. Um, it, super fine London cloths, common London cloths, swans down Orleans and uh, silk stripes, velvets, of course, boots and shoes, um, kid shoes, or kid leather shoes is what they meant, silk hose and silk socks, uh, ladies' beaver hats, ginghams and domestics. Domestics would cover the calicos and the plains and that sort of thing. And they sewed dyes also. You notice down here, uh, where is it, Spanish indigo, and then they sold, obviously, spirits and candies and stuff like this. But they were always down at the bottom would say, besides a variety of ladies' trimmings and fancy articles, too many of which to mention, you will, uh, all of which will be sold as low as any in the Western country for cash or cotton payments in the fall. Okay? I paid in cotton. Nobody had easy cash. Everybody lived on credit. So the books would start being cleaned up and turned up, whoops, turned over in the fall, and they would try to wrap them up in January because the cotton would be, be brought in and the, they could pay in cotton. And then the merchant could pay his debts by selling the cotton and sending his payment to the uh, the uh, factors and the warehouses in New York and Boston and Philadelphia where he had gotten his merchandise. Okay. Now, Al, did we skip something? Let's see here. Well, let me make sure. Okay. Where where did all these people come from? This is a, a map that I found that really helped me understand the, how the uh, country was populated. You can see in here very heavy population. Okay, the darker the color, the more people come down here, and we get kind of thin right here. Eighteen hundred, moving farther down, still heavily populated, but we've got some darker colors in here getting heavier. By 1810, we're still not that far over, but we've got some little areas over here in Louisiana, okay? But by 1820, we've got people here. Not many. 1810, we had about 10,000 people in this area, but it, it doubled and then quadrupled by 1825. Okay, but we're but all these people are coming down from the eastern seaboard. Alabama fever. Anybody ever heard that term? I know the archive people have. Alabama fever, and it literally was like a fever. It w it brought the development, at least in this area, of the absentee landlord. The eastern seaboard was being, the soil was being depleted and they had to find somewhere else to grow cotton or make some money. And these people that had, who had come down here reported back that this is good soil, I think we can do something with it. And they planted upland cotton, different than sea island cotton, short, short fibers. And they would first send maybe their oldest son down with supplies 
enslaved people to set up the the initial homestead, if you want to put it that way. Then, when the money started coming in, then they might come on down here too. But in the meantime, they sort of ran the place with their oldest son and the father who would still be on the eastern seaboard. Then later, after the Indian Wars were over, thousands of farmers and their families joined them when they got the word, we're being choked to death on the eastern seaboard. We're not able to, to get the kind of harvest that we used to, so we're going to try our hand at a new in a new place. That's how my people got here. They came down in Alabama fever looking for new land as many, many Alabama residents did. Okay. This one is in, from uh, let me see what I say here. This one is from Greensboro in 1820. Please excuse my scribbling, but this was the best one I could find out of my files. And you can see um, by this point, 1820, we are advertising fancy spring and summer goods from, where are we, New York, Philadelphia, okay? That was just the, the norm by then. Everybody expected those kinds of goods, but there's a catch. This was not first quality. This was not what what um, the members of the elite planter group would have wanted to wear. If they said silk here, it was the cheap. It was way down on the bottom of the quality scale. Um, but you can see um, em embroidered like tents, ladies' lace caps, um, black and white silk hose again. This Angola summer cloth is says it's a new and beautiful article for gentlemen's and summer gentlemen's summer coats and pantaloons. Merino is is wool. Italian lastings, pink uh, Geo de Nap, which is another, which was an imported fabric. So, by 1820, only a year after statehood, we've got a, quite a quite a selection of fabrics. Now, this doesn't mean that everybody is wearing this. Remember, we've got farmers and their families who may or may not have been able to advance themselves socioeconomically. So you're still going to have your poor farmers, your yeoman farmers, which are floating somewhere between the planter elite, which is generally considered like 20, um, they own 20 enslaved people. or So the yeoman farmers are a little bit less than this. But they're still, you know, having to work hard for everything they've got. And they are, my records indicate, if you look at the day books, I mean, the, the books that the stores kept on a daily basis, these are not what is selling, okay? These silks and painted zephyr, which is sort of a very thin muslin, which is almost like chiffon, but not quite. That's not what's going out of the store. What is going out of the store are calicos, planes. Every once in a while you'll see some silk, but my research has indicated that that's usually a seamstress or a tailor, somebody who is catering to a, a higher economic strata. Most of what's going out of there is cotton, planes, Osnabergs, the very basic domestics, sheeting. So um, that is partly due to the fact that of the way the merchants got their 
uh, goods, they would travel twice a year to either Augusta, Charleston, or Savannah, somewhere on the eastern eastern coast, where like a wholesaler would have brought things down from New York or Boston or Philadelphia, which saved him some time to do that, or they would go to New York and deal with the suppliers there. Well, you, bargains were struck, you know, I'll give you this much if you'll, you know, haggle back and forth. And some of these things, it, it sort of is indicated, excuse me, indicated that they were sort of like teasers. They may have one or two pieces of something in the store, but not enough to make a huge big difference. Excuse me. Unfortunately, we're not given the quantities or anything that they have. Sometimes you can actually find the shipping records and and the inventory records and things that indicate how much they actually ordered. But I'm always was always surprised how little how little yardage they ordered of these more fancy fabrics as opposed to how much Osnaberg and Calico and um, you know plain linen and things like that, the everyday fabrics that most of the population would have wanted. Okay. Anybody know who that is? <coughs> Just holler it out if you know who they are. <laughs> oh, did I put? Oh, shoot. I pushed the button. <laughs> well, now you know. It's Josephine Bonaparte. What is she... She have to do with this. She had a. She was a huge influence on the fashions and choices of fabric in the early part of the 19th century. If you look outside in the um, display, you'll see some coral earrings. She's got on a coral necklace. Okay. She said she was a trendsetter. Now, why? The, psych, fashion has cycles, and there are reasons why those why the changes happen. Okay, you just people just don't wake up in the morning. They may think they do, but there's things that they've been influenced by this whole time to fashion leaders decide we're going to make a little bit of change here. All right. Oops, I'm going to point out something here. See this comb right here? Or it's called a, dia, a bando diadem. Now, it could be this person has one here. That is supposed to be up there. She's got one in her hair right there, too. It could be like that. Pretty fancy schmancy. But it was more than likely a comb. I, when I started looking, because it just made no sense that that would be in these tiny little crossroad stores and they're advertised in their newspaper, you know, advertisements. But that just didn't make any sense. And so I started looking. And another name for them, a bando diadem, is a bando comb. And so they would have also a supply of combs. But to go ahead, who's that? Napoleon, Josephine's husband, he needs no introduction. He, in 1798, went to Egypt, or went to the east, to um, try to keep the British, keep their influence at bay. But he did take a large group of scientists and, and historians and antiquarians, is what we would call them now, and they went into the Valley of the Kings, and into Luxor, and they documented 
what was in the tombs. They brought a lot of things back. And Josephine just fell in love with all of it. And so, 1798, it's the same year of the Mississippi Territory. Okay, these people are reading newspapers. They're traveling back and forth, listening to people on the front of newspapers at that in that day. You didn't have to pay the AP to run a story about something in Britain or something in France. They just printed it verbatim and put it on the front page, and people were reading about this, reading about what was happening in France and Napoleon and his exploits. But I just find, whoa, same year. Hmm. Okay. Somebody else, between 1801 and 1812, Thomas Bruce, the seventh Earl of Elgin in Great Britain, he went and raided the Parthenon and other parts of Greece, brought things back. And this was their interp one of their interpretations, one of their drawings of what the costume in Greece may have looked like. Now, very droopy and soft. Okay. The chitons and the all of it. See the hair? Pay attention to the hair. Very soft. These these uh, borders and trims down here. Very soft fabric that clings to the body. So the stage is set. We've got we've got people removing this direction. So everything is set for whoa for us to have international goods. And here's an example of the Blakely Sun. This one didn't come out really where. So they are getting their information. The first question is, well, if they're so isolated, where are they getting all their information from? A lot of it was simply talking to people, writing letters to their friends on the East Coast. Their friends are sending them copies of various pictures they may have gotten. Now, magazines didn't even really begin to have fashion plates until the mid-1830s. So they're not getting this out of, you know, the latest fashion magazine. Newspapers, they're trusting newspapers to tell them that this is the latest thing from New York. And American fashion, of course, is controlled by Paris predominantly up until the 1970s. And so if Paris said it, that was all you needed to hear. So there was a magazine in Britain in 1770 called the Ladies Magazine. This is unusual in that it had a sketch in here of a garment, but most ladies' magazines were just um, etiquette, morals, religion. It, they didn't have fashion in them. So where are they getting all this? This is just an example of what might have been in the 1840s, okay? Not back in this early time period, okay? Oops. Godies didn't even show up until 1836, Godies Ladies Book. And you'll see a if on the far wall out there when you go into the lobby, there is a print very similar to this of fashions from July 1842. And Godey's was one of the first ones, not the first, to have fashion plates. Now, I looked through issue after issue after issue, and the first reference I found to any sort of subscription in Alabama was in 1848. You could buy a club plan where people would go in for $2.00, and you could get one issue and it would come into the general store and then it would be circulated 
around. We don't have subscription figures on Godey's. We just have the editorial comments where he made Lewis Godey makes comments back to people. <coughs> so the excuse me. The first that we that I have found was in 1848 saying that her subscription was delayed. And then if you look back in some of the other issues, there were some transportation problems coming down, coming down the Mississippi at that point. Okay, so magazines were not where they were getting anything. The biggest things were just chit-chatting, just talking to people. And the lower economic levels were watching the planters, watching the upper levels, that's nothing new, to see what they were wearing. And every woman knew how to sew. You, you just knew. Or you knew how to teach somebody else to do it for you. And so the way the garments were made, they were, they were the fabric was placed directly on the body. Patterns are a, a much later um, development. Fabric was placed directly on the body and so women knew enough about sewing and using fabric that they could go home with their calico and with their planes and they could make what they saw. Okay? One of the biggest uh, sources for information is the general store. That was the hub of the community, was the general store. They traveled, that's where all the information came into, and uh, a lot of indications that the men were mostly the ones in town, and so I can imagine Mrs. Jones saying, now don't forget to ask, you know, Mr. Smith, the storekeeper, you know, if the latest magazine or the latest news has come in. Now, another thing, uh, source of information were factors, commercial factors, who did the buying many times for the elite planters for their families. The mistress of the plantation, the wife would put in an order and he would bring it home. Now, the general store owners and the merch, the factors were not as separated as we are led to believe. They had much more communication with each other than we are led to believe. So that's another source of information flow. Now, got just a few minutes left. I want to show you what someone who was up on fashion and even, you know, farmers' wives, if they wanted to take the time out of their busy day, could have uh, made. Remember I showed you the picture of the soft fabrics, the, the general from Egypt and Greece, that influence? Well, this was an interpretation, okay? See how, that's muslin. See how fine that is? When I say muslin, their muslin bore no resemblance to our muslin. Muslin is not something that we, you know, want to just put out there. This was beautiful stuff, and you can see how diaphanous it is. Well, we have records of people, of women, who were very bold and they dampened themselves, and so this would cling just like they imagined that the fabric would be like on one of the Egyptian statues or the Greek statues. It clung to the body. Well, they may or may not have worn their undergarments. They were quite shocking, but we do have records that there were women who did not wear their undergarments, but most of them did. They still had their corsets, their pantaloons, their chemise, all that underneath. We have an example in this uh, Sarah Hainsworth Gale garment that was out 
here. Um, it's a very fine muslin. It's beautifully made. It looks like a nightgown with long sleeves, but it's basically this style, and it was in the teens in Alabama. Oops. Okay, here's another example. And you, so you can see there's a lot of trim and that it, much, clinging to the body much more and a, a sort of a, a Grecian feel with the trim here. Now, as you go on through the teens, things start to be not quite so clingy and you couldn't have this big old coat and not have your police here soft and flowy. I call it kind of drippy. You know, it's just sort of floating around there. And notice the woman's hat. Okay, this is 1811. Even the men were wearing much, were wearing tighter fitting garments than before. But you can already see that there's just the slightest hint of something just a little wider than that original very clingy fabric. Okay, now here's a better. In 1817, trims were a big deal because there wasn't that much color. White, gray, black. This is black. Okay, trim especially. 1818, right here. 1819, we're starting to move out just a little here. The 20s, we're picking up more trim and more doodahs for a, a lack of a better word, 1820. Now we're moving into the mid-1820s, and you can really see that it's beginning to get full down here. See the trim here? Well, that's not trim. It's like a, a, a heavy piping is stuffing down there at the bottom. The sleeves are starting to puff out, okay? Now, the more fabric, common sense, the more fabric is in the garment, probably the more money the person has to spend on these elaborate sleeves. And see this uh, ruching right in here? I think it's a lot of fabric to do that. Okay, then we have the wonderful circus-like 1830s where... They just sort of went hog wild with these sleeves. All right, this didn't last a long time. But now this is an extreme example, but it gives you an idea. But there's a lot of fabric going on in here. Okay? Now, let's not leave out the gentleman. 1830s, we still have these fuller sleeves. And the gentleman's coats have gotten longer, a little bit, uh, the feeling of a little bit uh, width, not as slim. There's the beaver hat. Okay, now I'm going to stop right there at the 1830s because by the 1840s, you can look in so many advertisements in small towns, in Montgomery, in um, just so many towns, and everything's the same. Everybody by this point has their sources, has their jobbers who supply them with, you know, clothing and textiles and things, and so it gets pretty homogenized by by that point. Um, 1830s is really where everything sort of catches up. So, the world was coming to Alabama. It had been here many, many years before we became a state. So I, w I want to challenge you. Somebody asked me to do this one time, and I was kind of astounded. I just went home and looked at all of the labels in my clothes, and I was astounded at the world that was hanging in my closet. Okay? So I want you to check your labels. 
who's got their fabric, still got their fabric, I want you to really think about what's in your hand, what's on your body, and that you're not just wearing uh, a product of the Industrial Revolution. You're, you're carrying around history with you every day. Thanks. Oh, before I, before I finish, I wanted to say this subject is so vast that for every change that you see in design in the area of clothing or textiles, you see corresponding changes in furniture design, housing, China. You could, you could, have a, you could spend a day on each one of those branches. This is a very consolidated overview of design through the eyes of textiles. But thank you for letting me share that. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for coming. And we're going to take a couple of questions. Remind you that we are recording the Q&A, so please wait for the microphone and encourage you to go ahead, if you haven't already done so, and fill out your evaluation forms. Those are important for us. First question. Thank you. Uh, when did the home sewing machine come into use? Not until the mid... 1850s. Mm -hmm. Everything was done by hand. And it really did not become widely used in many, many homes until in the 60s. So up until that point, it was handmade. And so you either had to know how to sew, have a lot of money to have somebody make your clothes, or you didn't have clothes. Hey, Diane. Hey. Um, I just wanted to have you talk just a little bit about your research, like what collections and stuff you looked at, because you talked about it in your presentation. It was just interesting to me, like the things that you were able to find and glean out from, from that. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I started, my dissertation topic came out of just something that I noticed that I was seeing these advertisements for all of these fabrics and granted you've got different levels of quality but the fabrics were still there in that like that bandeau and the kids shoes and all that sort of stuff but the day books were that's not what was going out of the store and so i began to get interested in really looking at general stores and how they operated and where did they get their their product, hoping that that would, um, you know, give me an indication as to the discrepancy that I was seeing. And then just reading journals and looking at magazines and poring over newspapers till I was cross-eyed, I just began to puzzle all this together. And Traveler's Records, uh, Anne Royal, was a, a traveler who came through here and she made comments about how surprised how well dressed the ladies of Huntsville were and how fashionable they were and Mobile was a hotbed of you know just the best and the most exclusive because they had a lot of money so I just I just would read and read and read and newspapers are still one of my favorite things to just sit down and look at so anybody else well I can tell you that I was working in reference when Diane came in and did some research here about two years ago and she was quite thorough she put us through our paces pulling 